Remove the weight and the cares of this week, the things that are coming, the things that have been, the things that haven't been, Lord. We just surrender it all to you, Jesus. Settle our hearts now. Fix, we fix our eyes on you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We worship you, God. We worship you. Praise your holy name, God. You are good. You are holy. You are kind. You are present, Jesus, and you're worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, Lord. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah I raise a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'll raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I'll raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery, I'll raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. praises roll up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive sing a little louder
you're gonna hear my praises roar and up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive oh i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna season right now with uncertainty and things in the news and in life and in our own personal lives that doubt can come, anxiety can come. We can come to church and we get all fired up and then by Tuesday we're like, "Uh, what's happening, right? But there's something powerful. I don't want to breeze by that song. Those words are truth. My weapon is a melody standing and singing and declaring the truth of who God is and reminding myself of his faithfulness is a weapon and it does defeat the enemy. It does restore hope. It does restore our perspective. It writes us back to the posture of being a son and a daughter. So don't forget that tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Don't forget that when you're in that place of discouragement, you're in that place of hopelessness or doubt or whatever it might be. Sing. Let your weapon be a melody. Let the truth of God's word restore that faith in you because he'll meet you in those places. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. So don't let your heart be trouble hold your head up I don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus swing wide swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus You're not looking for perfection There's no need in me pretending I'll give you everything I'll give you everything You deserve my full attention Sin less than my devotion. Speak to me and I will listen. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. Oh. selfish motives search me till there's nothing hidden I'll give you everything I'll give you everything
If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, if you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my Through your spirit, God, change us, God. Ah, but we belong to you. say that to him, Abba, I belong to you. Jesus, we belong to you. Lord, we don't want to hold anything back from you. But we're people and we're broken and we live in a broken world. So it feels safer, feels like we have control when we hold some stuff back. But we want to we wanna give you all of us. We want to give you, we want to surrender our hearts to you. We want those words of that song to be true, Lord, that you can have. You can have my heart. You can have my will. You can have my spirit. We choose you. We choose your presence. We choose to surrender to the one who's on the throne. The place where our hearts are safe, are cared for, are transformed, are renewed, are set free. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. God, awaken our spirits to your voice this morning. Lord, would all defenses and offenses and just baggage be set aside in Jesus' name. Lord, we want ears to hear you, your heart, your agenda, your motives, not ours. Not just in Derek's, Lord. We want your voice to speak and move this morning and we want to receive from you so give us the capacity to hear you and to see you and to respond to you and we ask all this in the matchless name of jesus amen you can be seated
Hey, good morning. Am I on? There we go. Hey, and online too. Good to see everyone. Hey, just real quick, there's many of you online. We actually have a, more people watching online than we do in the tent, so pretty incredible. And just want to say thank you if you have been some of the people who've dropped us notes in the last few weeks. We will probably never meet you because you're from different places in the United States and world, but thank you for being a part of this journey. Like the last, it's been like 170 days, by the way. Uh, that COVID's hit. So, um, and I know some of you online as well are local and you're going to come jump in the tent with us soon. So for the rest of you, welcome to the Newcom Tabernacle. Um, this is, if you don't know what the Tabernacle is, Old Testament tent, but um, it's the, where the people met God. So this is the Newcom tent. Um, and today, the 40-year-old Derek gets to preach and have a conversation with a young 39-year-old Justin, so <laughs> you're like two weeks behind yeah, me. Yeah, two weeks, yeah. and then we'll be in the same uh, walker <laughs> boat. Did I say walker? Yeah. I meant, a, I meant to say boat. Hey, we're in Matthew chapter 5 today. We're going to be focusing uh, speci- specifically on verse 13 and 14. So either open your Bible or turn on your Bible. You know what I mean by that, whatever, if you go analog or digital, whatever you have. And if you have a live channel, get that out. And what we're going to do today is we really want to have, Justin and I wanted to co-teach this. Um, if you guys have been a part of a conversation, you can keep up with co-teaching. Um, but what we wanted to do is really talk about a message that we think um, the last 170 days that has been, I think, revealed to us and that's been forming and shaping us as a church as well. So that's what we're going to talk about If you uh, didn't hear the message last week, please go back and listen to that. I think it was a message that really is going to form our community. I know it was important for a lot of people as well. You know, we went after two things. We were joking last week, two things you're not supposed to talk about, uh, politics and religion. We're like, let's just do both (laughs) together. And we did that. And really, what does the Sermon on the Mount or the way of Jesus teach about that? So we did a message called The Politics of Jesus. It wasn't, it wasn't politics and Jesus. It was the politics of Jesus. And the purpose of that message was to look at Jesus and the way of Jesus and for that to inform our position on public policy and the way that we're actually going to vote here in a few months. And so if you haven't seen that online or in person, please go back And you'll understand a lot of who we are as a church and what we're going after that we actually want. I know that sounds funny, but we actually want Jesus in the way of Jesus to inform and to frame and shape the way we do church, the way we live, how we interact with people, how we spend our money, all of it. We want to invite Jesus into every avenue of our lives. Are are you with me on that? Um, And so we want to be Jesus people is the phrase we always throw around. And so what our goal is a little bit, not just today, but, and you've heard us say this, we want to be more like Jesus and less like church, right? We attach these churchy things onto this Jesus movement, and we want to just bring it back into this place of it's about Jesus. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to go after a message that is entitled, and this is going to be very conversational but the salt and light manifesto. Now, some of you might hear that word manifesto and be like, whoa, usually hear it like in a weird context. But by definition, the word manifesto just means a public proclamation for action or a public declaration. This is what we're going to do. And so our journey today is super simple. It's two parts. Number one, we're going to look at what Jesus, Jesus is actually talking about. Like, what is he actually saying in verse 13 and 14, when he talks about you are the salt, and it's this identity statement, not you can be or you should be like salt, but you are salt, and then he says in 14, and you are light. And again, what does he actually mean by that, number one? And then two, we're going to bring that into our context, and some of the conversation that we want to have is what does that actually mean for Jesus people? So we don't want to just leave it in the context of, okay, we listen to Jesus, and he's taught. But what does that mean for us as Jesus people? Two, what does it mean in the way we do church? We actually want to get to the roots of that. And what does it maybe, like what does that look for the Newcom story? How does that actually inform 
the way we operate as, as a community. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And I think for me, um, and I speak for you as well on this, because we've talked about this. In the last 170 days, we're stepping into this message with a lot of purpose and intentionality. Because for us, we believe that God's revealing something to us, and we want to bring you guys into that story. We don't know exactly what it is, but we went to the, the words of Jesus, salt and light, and how do we do church this way? What does it like to do church in a way that you all are the salt and the light of the world? So we want to bring you into the season a little bit. Yeah, and I, I think, obviously, we want to start with Scripture. I know Derek mentioned it, but we'll be in Matthew chapter 5 if you haven't found it already. And two, just because you heard salt and light, um, stop disqualifying it like we've all heard it and understand it because God has something new to yeah. say um, yeah. today. It's no fresh revelation from God himself. It's revelation from Scripture. But again, more like Jesus and less like church. So let's get into what God says, clean the palate, and just listen cleanly and clearly to what God's saying. And really, Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of why Matthew even wrote his gospel. Mm. And so Matthew drops in, and he's fulfilling what Jesus asked him to do right before Jesus was done being on earth after the resurrection, right? right? And he says that you should make disciples, but then you should teach them the things that I have told you. This is Matthew teaching us the things that Jesus had told them. That's right. Okay? Super basic. Yeah, Don't. this is almost, just real quick, I never thought about that. It's almost, yeah. it, it is, it's like right in between, right, the arrival of Jesus yeah. and the departure of Jesus. And this is like right in the middle of him saying, yeah. this is how you are supposed to live. He's right? like, yeah, these are the things, right? And this is, this is how seriously Matthew took yeah. it. He's one of the Gospels that we look at maybe the most out of all the Gospels. And so Matthew is fulfilling what Jesus has asked him to do. And in that way, Matthew is being salt and light, quite literally, even for us right now but these passages Matthew 5 6 7 but today we'll be looking at 5 they hold some of the greatest values that you can apply to living a kingdom lifestyle period so you can attach your life to a lot of things you can drop your roots into a lot of things for me I'm gonna fundamentally primarily drop my roots into the fact that I love Jesus I'm sold out 100 percent for him with my life yeah. but the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 5 Six and seven are huge for me as a Jesus follower. Don't get lost in everything else first. I want to get lost in this first, to be really honest with you. And then I want to look at the rest of the scripture because Jesus is how I've come to know God the Father, period. So, internal framework. This message from Jesus is literally a kingdom message. Jesus people, kingdom people. Same thing, kingdom of God. That's what we're talking about. Anytime we teach about the kingdom of God or its principles or its qualities, the first thing we have to remember is that what Jesus tells us about the kingdom or its qualities is meant to bring down the walls of the kingdom of Justin or the kingdom of insert your name there, yeah. right? It's meant to bring down the walls of the kingdom you would prefer to build, live in, and operate in yourself. Does that make sense? So the kingdom is always waging this, it's pushing forward with this destruction path over the way you would prefer to live your life and giving you a new way to live it out. It brings down your personal kingdom, and it's really important that it does that before you start looking at other people's kingdoms, right? Because, man, I can operate on your life all day long. No problem. I can find what doesn't look right, and you can do the exact same thing to me, but the kingdom's supposed to do something different than that. And not only is it supposed to break down the walls of our own kingdom, anytime we hear kingdom of God messages or messages about the qualities of the kingdom, it's meant for us to maybe ask the same questions about how we operate and function as a church. Not maybe just Newcom, but the church. How are we behaving as the church? And then beyond that, I would look even closer and to say that it's probably asking us to ask some questions about here and now, the way that we operate and function. What have we allowed church to become? Is it in line with the kingdom? Is it not? Um, and what must we continue to be becoming as a church? The last 170 plus days have been powerful for us as a church. And I think that it means the territory ahead is different than the landscape that's been behind. And so we want to be kingdom people rooted in his kingdom, mm -hmm. have his kingdom own our kingdom, and then have us look at how we function even as a church, as kingdom people. Does that make sense? And that's kind of the framework I want us to operate with. Derek's going to take us into Matthew 5, and um, unless you have a response, 
<laughs> I was just thinking, man, I, I, <laughs> I, love that, I love that question, how do we align our church, so us, how do we align our church with the, the kingdom? Yeah. Right? And it's not the other way around. We're not trying to align the kingdom with the way that we do church. And I think if you're taking notes, that's a very important question. Uh, because that is not just for the community. That's also for you as an individual because we are trying to align ourselves with the kingdom, right? Not in a way that we do church. And so I think it's important if you're taking notes. So Matthew chapter 5, um, this really is, if you're looking um, at, at the scripture, either digital or, or um, analog, it probably says the Sermon on the Mount on there. Now that's what we refer to it as, but if you're thinking like first century, right, this crowd is following Jesus, we'll get to that in a moment. They didn't say like, hey, what is Jesus doing? Oh, he's going to go give the Sermon on the Mount, right? That's not what it was called. It was like, hey, what is this crowd of thousands or tens of thousands of people? Like, what is going on? And people are like, this guy Jesus is going to go teach, I guess, on the side of this mountain. That's what it was. It was so Jesus. They didn't, they didn't sell tickets? It was Jesus, yeah, teaching on the side of a mountain. That's what it was to bring this context. And so... Before chapter 5, though, because we have this crowd. If you look at verse 1, it talks about this crowd and the disciples. I want to give some context to that because it's very important of understanding, like, well, where did this crowd come from? And I believe it actually gives context to why Jesus says salt and light in the following passages when we get farther into chapter 5. But if you go back to chapter 4, the very end, we see that Jesus is, and this is all the same Story. So a lot of times when you read scripture, it has these, these chapter divisions or passages. That's for us. So when we say Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you can find it. We're not saying like, hey, open up the scroll, you know what I mean? And it's like paragraph 16 all the way to the indentation on the right. You know where to get it. Does that make sense? But what happens is when we read Matthew chapter 5, we disconnect it from Matthew chapter 4. Are you with me? But Matthew chapter 4 gives this context of Jesus is all around Galilee. And it says that he's going out. Listen to this. Going out, and that's purposeful, intentional. And he's preaching one about the kingdom. He's going out. He's loving others. And it says he's going out, and he's having compassion on those who are afflicted. So do you hear that over and over? He's going out. Going out, right? He's not staying And that's where we're going to go today. He's not staying somewhere, waiting for people to come to him. He's on mission. He's going out, preaching kingdom, love, and compassion. Now, we don't know if Jesus actually went to these places that it it mentions or if his message just got there. But it says that he went all through through Galilee, which is this. And listen to the, the differences in this, the nuances. This is like the traditional, conservative, religious area. But he also went across to the Decapolis. The Decapolis is two words, deca, and then you guys know from last week, polis, which means city or boundary. So it's, it's 10 cities. And this was the hub of like pagan Roman Greek culture. They actually worshiped the president or worshiped politics, worshiped the emperor Caesar, as he is going to be the one that restores um, this land and brings hope to us. They actually called Caesar many times the son of God, which is fascinating in itself. But it was very pagan. He also went to Judea, which is the country folk. And then he also went to Jerusalem, which is the urban sprawl within Judea. And it says, lastly, he went, or his message, went even across the Jordan. So across the Jordan is a kind of, um, I think it's okay to say this, across the railroad tracks in our culture, right? It's going to the other side of town that you've been told you don't go over there because people don't look like you, right? They're different than you. And Jesus goes across. Now, here's why I I want you to see all of this. Because when we get into Matthew chapter 5 and it says this crowd, this crowd, these people are the people that Jesus immersed himself and planted himself in their culture. And now what? People from Galilee from the 10 cities, the Decapolis, people from the the country, people from the urban city of Jerusalem, people who really aren't supposed to be there from the other side of the Jordan. These are the people, when Matthew writes, the crowd is following. These are the people who are following Jesus. Why? Because he went out, right? He immersed himself 
into their culture. He put himself in the middle of the community, right? And now, and what did he do when he got there? He preached kingdom. He preached love and showed love. He had compassion on people. And so get this image. As we open up in Matthew chapter 5, you kind of have this misfit group of people. I want you to see this because it's a beautiful picture of how church should be. Church should never look like everyone should be the same, have the same hobbies, vote the same. It should not be that way because as this group is following Jesus to, hey, where are you going? Oh, Jesus is going to preach on the mountainside, Sermon on the Mount. You have people who are religious and you have people who are pagans, right? People who have been worshiping the emperor as God himself. You have country folk who really are the, the poor, and then you have some of the people from Jerusalem who are the religious and the financial elite. You even have, you read the end of Matthew chapter 4, you have at least one person who was filled with, with a demon. Now, not anymore. Jesus showed him compassion or her compassion and released this demon from that person, from the individual. But you have what is called a demoniac, someone who was filled with uh, a demonic or evil dark force. Do you see this? Men, women, children, pagans, religious, the, the elite, the, the rich, the wealthy, the, the known, the no names, the outsiders, someone who used to be filled with a demon, and that is called the beautiful thing of church, right? And this is who's following Jesus now into the Sermon on the Mount. So two things I, I, I want you to write down. They'll be up on the screen. They're going to form and give framework to the rest of the message. Number one is this. The way of Jesus is to be everywhere. Or you can flip it and say, to be everywhere is the way of Jesus. Does that make sense? And so think about Jesus, what we read about him, what we heard about him in chapter 4. Jesus went out, or his message went out everywhere. It didn't just stay in Galilee with the religious elite, the traditional, and the conservatives. It went to the pagans, those who worship other people. It went to these dark areas, went to people that were the outcasts. It went to the country. It went to the city. Jesus put himself, listen please, into, because this is for us, into culture. And he planted himself in the middle of the community. And when he got to the middle of culture and community, that's when he began to preach kingdom, show love, and show compassion to the afflicted and to the darkness of the world. Are you with me? And so this is what's leading into Matthew chapter 5. So the second one I, I want you to, to write down is this. The way of Jesus is to affect the community. I think I got that right, by the way. Is it is affect, A-F-F, any English majors out there, A-F-F-E-C-T, not E-F-F. So um, did I get it right? You should be an English teacher, right? Thank you. I got it from the, the, the teacher, man. Derek, you got it um, right. Yeah, I asked my wife, too. To and affirm, I asked Justin this morning. I want to like, affirm we you. We think. In that. Yeah. <laughs> well done. So again, the way of Jesus, so Jesus doesn't just go to the community. He doesn't just plant himself in culture. When he gets there, what happens? The way of Jesus, the way he lives, it has this effect on the community. So remember those two words, everywhere and to effect. And so real quick, uh, verse number one, seeing the crowds, when Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now real quick, I want to make sure we know the crowd is there with them. The reason we know that, it's not just the disciples. At the end of his sermon of chapter 5, 6, and then at the end of chapter 7, it says the crowds heard his teachings and they were amazed or they were astonished by what they have heard. And so the teachings of Jesus in this place are how Jesus' people, two things, are supposed to live on mission. It's just a part of your life. And two, how we're supposed to live in community. So think about this. Matthew was watching this happen, and Matthew is just publicly recording the things that Jesus is saying, right? He's publicly, this is a public recorded record of Jesus saying, if you are a follower of me, so he's speaking to everyone in here, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is how you are supposed to live under my lordship and in my kingdom. So this is a massive call. This is how you are supposed to to live. And so for me, when I look at this, let me put some weight on it for me in the last 170, 170 days. I go, either you and I do this or we choose not to. That's right. Does that make sense? 
So either we choose the words of Jesus and say, we're actually going to live this way. I can't preach sitting down. Um, We're actually going to live this way, or we're not. And I hope you're like me. When you hear that stuff, you're like, this compels me. Are you with me? Like, we actually want to live like Jesus. We actually want to live underneath the lordship of Jesus. We actually want to see his kingdom come through us. And that's where Jesus gets to this place where he begins to talk about you are two things. Yeah, and I think on the way there, you explain that diverse crowd, which is so important, right? Yeah. And Jesus is looking out over this vast landscape. You know, we all keep our cards hidden when we come to church. Like, I don't know everybody's absolute individual story, but Jesus looks over the landscape of every person. And what he says to them, essentially, is that I don't want any of you to feel excluded from me extending my benefits to you. That's how he starts in Matthew 5, verse 1, right? It says blessed. The word blessed literally means I'm going to be extending my, my benefits to you. I'm going to extend my blessing to you. And listen to the people that he says his blessing extends to. We're talking about the rich, the poor, the other side of the tracks, the right side of the tracks. I feel like I grew up with one foot on both sides. So it's just one of those things. I don't know where I land, but these are who Jesus is talking to. He includes everybody. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they'll be satisfied. If you're merciful, um, you'll receive mercy from me. The pure in heart, you'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall see. They shall be um, sons of God, called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom. And when others revile or persecute you or utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, he's extending the benefits of himself to whatever label you might be wearing over yourself. And this is the way of Jesus. He doesn't need to play the left. He doesn't need to play the right. He doesn't need to play the middle. He plays, I am the Son of God. I am God manifest. This is how God loves. This is how God extends his blessing. And so it's for everyone that was with him. It was extended to all of the crowds. And I think it's important. And then he lands in these two, you know, identity statements that we really want to focus on today. And Derek's going to take the first one here. Yeah, real quick, I, just, I love that one of the translations that we were talking about earlier, instead of, instead of blessed, it says happy. And that's actually a terrible translation uh, because I don't think anybody in here is like, hey, I'm happy um, when I mourn, right? It, that, it's actually not a good translation. I love what you said. The word bless actually means that, as Justin said, God is extending his benefits upon you, right? So there's this covering that's happening. And what God is actually, or Jesus is doing, is he's saying, you want to see what kingdom people look like? Read those passages. That's actually the snapshot of what kingdom people look like. Um, These people who are poor in spirit, who are, are meek, who hunger for and thirst for righteousness. So this isn't like somewhere else, someone else. This is this is you. This is what kingdom people actually look like. And so then in verse 13, this identity statement, the first one that Jesus gets to, he says, you are the salt of the earth. We want you to see that this is not detached from what Jesus just said. So it's not that, and again, this is where the passage or the chapter divisions cause confusion sometimes when he talks about those who inherit the kingdom or the earth or your reward is in heaven. And then he gets in the 13 and says, you are the salt of the earth. It's not a different group of people. This is still that same crowd from the 10 cities, from from the urban dwelling, from the country, from the other side of the tracks, from the traditionalist conservative population. These are those same people. He's speaking to the same ones. So you are the salt of the earth. And Jesus says, you are, right? Not that you could be. Not that you are like that. It's not even really a metaphor. I'll call it that probably the rest of the message. But he's saying, this is your identity. You are the salt of the earth. And he's not talking about you as an individual. He's actually talking about the community, and it's important. So the actual word that Jesus uses is closer to the word you all. I just did a wedding this this weekend. Um, 
uh, for some friends back here that attend, and um, they're all from Texas. Um, the family isn't, but the, the daughter's from Texas and her now husband. And I didn't, I've heard you all in one day more than I've ever heard. But this is what, this is actually the, the word Jesus is using. He's saying, you all are the salt of, I have to work on that a little bit, are the salt of the earth, right? You all are the salt of of the earth. And so he's talking to you as a community. And so when Jesus is talking about this, you kind of have to hear almost this like this Palestinian southern, southern drawl that Jesus has when he uses this word. But when he uses it um, and says, you are the salt of the earth, he's not talking about, when he says earth, he's not talking about the world here. The word that, that Matthew actually uses when he says earth He's actually saying that you are the salt, all of you, of the, the word is the land that you inhabit right now where your feet are. Does that make sense? So look where your feet are. Look where your feet are later. You are the salt, all of you as a community, the salt of the land where you, your feet are in the here and the now. And I think why that's so important, I think many times when we hear passages, and this is why Justin said, hey, kind of, you know, shatter the idea of what you know about salt and light a little bit. Let's put that to the side. Don't create your own message. Because when we hear that, we come up with this concept of it's foreign, it's future, and it's event-based. And let me just hit, hit those real quick. When we talk about salt of the land, where you are right now, and by the way, yes, if you're looking, I stopped wearing socks. I'm 40 now. That's, that's what happens. So um, that's where it all goes. Um, I see some of you, like, looking at it. Um, so, I know. I see. I see you who are not wearing socks out there. You 40-plus-year-old men. Um, but what, what Jesus is, is going after here, when he talks ab- about this, it's not, it's not future. It's not foreign. It's not event-based. So, many times when we hear salt of the earth, we think, okay, it's something that's going to happen in the future. And Jesus is saying, no, it's actually your identity now. Or, hey, it's foreign. It's the earth. We're the salt of the earth. So I'll go on a trip, right, on what we label as a mission trip. We'll go. It's foreign. I'll be the salt there. No, it's here and now where your feet are planted in this moment. Or it's event-based. Hey, let's do something for the community. Let's, let's do something where we invite the community here. Yes, that could be a part of it, but it's not just event-based. It's here. It's now. It's present. It's happening in this moment because it's your identity. You all are the salt of the earth right where you live in the here and now. And so Jesus is using this this fascinating imagery of salt and saying, all of you are like that. Now, that probably doesn't make sense to us. So let me see, go with me on this. See if I can maybe bring some clarity to it. Imagine I told you, you all are like, the, you all are like sand, or you all are like Mexican food. I'll, I'll explain it. <laughs> you all are like coffee, right? So whatever local San Diego metaphor you want to use, the idea here is that it's, it's local to the community that Jesus is preaching, and two, that those things are everywhere, right? So if you go, there's sand everywhere in San Diego. You even get it in your car, especially if you have kids, Right? Mexican food, I was talking to Ryan Ash about this the other day. It's not just like, um, hey, we need to find a place for Mexican food. It's like, what 10 places um, do we have to figure out? And if you're good enough at it, if you lived in San Diego long enough, you should know this. You don't go to the same place for, the Mex- for Mexican food. If you want a breakfast burrito, you go somewhere. If you want, right, if you want tacos, you go somewhere else. You don't go to the same place, right? Um, And then also coffee. And we're not talking about Starbucks. We're talking about local places. The point is this. They're everywhere. Are you with me? They're everywhere. Sand, Mexican food, right? Coffee is everywhere. And so you laugh at that, but Jesus is saying the same thing, right? Jesus is talking to this community. When he says, you all are the salt of the earth, they're like, we get that. Why? Because in first century, salt is everywhere. For us, it's not. I mean, everywhere. You're talking about 
It was to flavor food. We do that. It was, it was to preserve meat. It was to treat leather. It was used in covenant rituals. It was for burial rituals, birth rituals, right? It was for medicine. I mean, it was for a lot of things. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is what Jesus is drawing out of this metaphor when he says, you all as a community have this, this identity as the salt of the land of where you are right now. You all need to be everywhere. You all need to be everywhere as the salt. And so that's what Jesus is going out of. So go back to Matthew chapter 4 real quick where we started. I know we didn't read this, but where was Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? Everywhere. Galilee. The ten cities, in the country, in the city, across the tracks, right? Just like salt, just like his teaching, and the people would have known this, right? He was everywhere. He was seeping into the fabric of culture, and he purposely put himself in the middle, listen to this please, in the middle of the community to be a part of the community. Just like Jesus' teaching of being salt Jesus is saying, this is what it means for my people to live. And I would extend it into the phrase, this is what it means for my people to do church. Not to just listen to the words of Jesus when he says, you are the salt, but to actually be like Jesus. And here's what that means. One, to place ourselves in the community. That's huge. To actually be in the community. Like intentionally place ourselves there. To enter into the middle of culture and to have engagement with the land that needs the salt, or another way to say it, the flavor of Jesus, right? And so the second thing I want you to write down this morning is this. And we made it personal. Write down, I bring the flavor of Jesus. And flavor, you can put an A on the end instead of an R if you want to go that way. Flavor. Flavor. I, I am the flavor of Jesus. And so how do you bring the flavor? How do you bring right, the salt? It's not from the top down. We spoke about that last few weeks. It's not from the top down with power, control, political power, starting a new crusade, right? That's not how you do it. Two, you don't do it by retreating. Guys, listen, the church has been bad at this. Somehow we've been taught, even using salt and light, that we're supposed to retreat from culture because culture is bad. Um, I've had people tell me, don't even use the word culture because culture is bad. And I'm like, that is not the teachings of Jesus at all. Um, that's not what we see Jesus doing. He's actually seeping into culture and influencing culture. So it's not from the top down, and it's not retreating away from culture and then setting up these subcultures of like, these hidden Christians. Does that make sense? Like our goal as Jesus' people, is not to hide from the world until Jesus returns. And if you heard me, you've heard Justin say that. That is not our goal. It's to be out in the world. So here's how we do it. How do we bring, how do you bring the flavor of Jesus? It's from the inside. It's Jesus going into Galilee. It's Jesus going into the ten cities, going into Jerusalem, going into Judea, going into uh, when he goes across the Jordan, into the, the villages and communities, and then he preaches kingdom, love, compassion, and we need to do the same. So here's what it takes, and this is for me as well. It's you, and it's, it's me, you and I, and I hope this convicts you a little bit, it does me, to leave our comfortable religious zones and to then get out in a place like salt, to get out in the culture, to get out into the community, and to establish ourselves in direct contact with people who don't go to church, people who are living in darkness, people who need to be loved, people who are afflicted, people who need compassion, to put ourselves in the middle of that to be with non-Jesus people. So let me, here's what I've been thinking. And let me just kind of throw this out. What does that look like for a church to actually put themselves in a place that not just during the week, right, because we're everywhere, not just during the week, but on Sundays, we're actually in the middle of culture. We're in the middle of the community. 
and people are hearing us preach kingdom. People are being loved. Like on Sundays, it's not just a gathering of, of Christians. It's people who are seen. Like when Jesus went to these different regions and he started preaching, and because they're passing by, they begin to see and hear these things. Is, is that, does that make sense? Like what would that look like if we did that? And here's what's fascinating in this 170 uh, day journey for us, God has pushed us online. And I don't know if you guys have looked at all, this is not arrogance, but when, we, when we're done with our messages, we've been getting somewhere between 800 and um, 1400 views. That's different computers, people watching, views. We've been getting notes from people from not only our local community who do not go to church, who do not go to church, some people who disagree with us, some people who actually have different spiritual views than we do as a church, and one of them, if you're looking online, thank you, actually said, hey, we're so intrigued by what you're teaching, our community that is not a Jesus community is actually going to take up an offering for Newcom, and they dropped it off last week, because, but here's the thing, why is that shocking to us? Shouldn't that be the norm? Shouldn't that be, be and why is that? Because we're in the public space now. And this is why God is revealing something to us. We're here. First we're online, but now we're here. And almost every Sunday since we've been out in the tent, we've had people drive by and stop in the parking lot and go, what's going on there? Walk in and say, hey, um, I'm intrigued by this message of kingdom. Or I've heard compassion and love and I've felt it from your people. It looks very different from, I'll be honest, it looks very different from us huddling in there. Are are you with me? And and for me, it's not just, it's not that it just looks different. There's something different that God's doing in us. I don't know what it looks like. He doesn't know what it looks like. Um, I think a few of you, um, I know a few of you have come to us and said, hey, how about we just do church like this from now on? Like, let's just do it like this. Like, and, I, and I asked you, well, what does that mean? You said, we're out here. It's not just outside. It's because we're more in the community. What, why don't we do church like that? Um, because people are more willing to engage. Listen, and I'll hand it to you in a moment, dude. I'm, 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 God's, God's hitting me right now, so thanks, man. All good, man. That's part of life. It shouldn't be a production anyway, right? Yeah. We said it was going to be a conversation today. Yeah, I've, I've realized that that God is, is doing something new in us as a church. And I think he's trying to reveal something to us of where we need to plant ourselves um, as a community. Again, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we want to be in a place that when we do this stuff, people just stop by. People see us. People are intrigued by it. And they become a part of, of this community. We want to be in the middle of Galilee. We want to be in the middle of the capitalists. We want to be in the middle of the other side of the Jordan, in the middle of, of uh, the urban sprawl or the, the country. We want to be in the middle of that. And we want to be a part of what Jesus is doing. And so um, I think you can agree with me on this. If not, it's okay. I think church has changed a lot, not just in the last 170 days, but over. I grew up in the church. There used to be these days, and you guys probably remember if you grew up in the church, you would go, hey, we're going to have bingo at the church, and the whole community shows up. That doesn't happen anymore. People don't flock to a church building. Um, that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, and this right here, for a lot of people who are in the darkness or the thick of it, and we'll talk about that a little bit in Isaiah 60, um, many times an enclosed building becomes a hurdle for people who don't know Jesus. And if you're someone who came to Jesus later on in your life, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's very difficult to enter in that this space, but this space is different. Our community space is, is different. Are you with me? Now, I don't know what that looks like. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out to you um, and going, I hope God stirs in you as well as we go through some of this. So, thanks, man. No, it's all good. I think um, bridging back into the text yeah. will take a little bit of a mind shift here um, in a good way. If we're the salt of the earth, we all know loud and clear the, what Derek has been sharing from Scripture and just from experience of the Holy Spirit in him is that we need to be in places where that salt actually is going to do something, right? So if it's not touching something, what good is the qualities of salt? 
That's good. Right? Bottom line. And therefore, it's vital that we recognize that it's easy for us to lose our saltiness, says the scripture. So if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored is what Jesus says. So it says, you're the salt of the earth, but if it loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Heavy statement from Jesus. But the reality is, if you are the salt of the earth, if we're the salt of the earth, all of us, then it's vital that we don't lose our flavor, right? And it's vital that we're in connection and relationship with others so that the salt can actually do what it's intended to do. And that's a moment-by-moment -moment thing. Um, and literally, if you think about how salt loses its saltiness, if you dilute it in water, if you put it in water, and it becomes watered down, it has less effect, yeah. right? It doesn't fulfill maybe what its purpose is. And this is a you are statement about you are the salt, but if you lose your saltiness, what good is it for? How will it be restored? And I just think it's important for us to keep in front of us that, man, we need to be in regular contact with people so that we're having regular engagement, understanding that we are the salt in that relationship, in those connections, in those places. And we have to remain the salt of the earth. So don't lose... Don't forget and lose your call. Don't forget and lose right. your kingdom influence. Don't forget and lose your love for the outsider or for the enemy even. Don't forget and become an angry, unforgiving, retaliatory person, which is what Jesus addresses in these texts. Remember that you need to be softened by these things of Jesus first so you can keep your salinity, so you can keep remaining salty. Um, and the, the worst thing for this text would be to read it and, and think, and read it with an everyone else mentality, right? It's other people who yeah. lose their saltiness. You know, they don't hold to the word, or they don't hold to this, or they don't hold to that. It's, well, remain in Jesus, and remain in relationship with others, with Jesus being the purpose you're in relationship with others. And you'll remain salty. That is what Jesus is calling mm -hmm. us to. And I think that's a big piece, and it leads into the next piece that Derek's going to share about, um, where Jesus says, that we're something else, that we're light in the world. Yeah, so again, quickly, Jesus is, is speaking. He's saying, you all. So this is speaking to a community again. And in the original language, it says not just of the world, but you are in the world or to the world is like the exact um, writings of Matthew. So you are not just of, meaning, because that uh, seems like a very de defensive posture. I'm the light of the world, but Matthew is actually saying you are the light to the world. Or the same, you are the light in the world. And Jesus is probably bringing these words from the mouth of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah 60, um, verse 1 through 3, Isaiah is talking about um, what it looks like to reveal God to the nations by being the light of the world. And so he's talking to Jesus' people, or God's people at that time. He's speaking to the nation of, of God's people. And he says this, Isaiah chapter 60, um, 1 through 3. He says this, and, and get the picture. He says, arise, shine. And so those, those words, that's active, right? And so think about the actual posture of what he's writing about. He's, he's saying, arise, and the word there can actually be arise and go, and then the third piece of that is shine. And so I want you to see that it's actually, he's calling us um, to stand up, the nation of Israel to stand up, and then to go so then you can shine. He goes on, he says, for your light has come, and the glory of the word there can also be the light of the Lord has risen among you. Verse 2, for behold, and listen to what the world looks like in this moment. The world, it says, shall be covered, darkness shall cover the world or the earth, and thick darkness will cover the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you. So there's this covering, right? Not just next to you. The Lord will rise upon you. There's this covering of His light and His glory. It says His light or His glory will be seen upon you all. And when that happens, verse 3 says, the nations or the people will see your light. How do they see your light? You have to be there, right? 
And he says, then the leaders or the kings will see the brightness of your rising. So Isaiah is, is giving kind of this linear thought of what God is calling his people to. He says, when, when you are called by God, it means that, and for us in our setting, that God has come to you, right? The light of the world, John talks about that. The light of the world has come to you, has come upon you now, has covered you in his light. And because you are now covered in the light of the one who brought the light, this is your role in the world. That in the darkness of this world and earth, in the darkness of that's covering people and it says thick, you are supposed to be in the world as light. You're supposed to be the light of the world in the darkness doing two things, revealing God, right? Light reveals things, revealing God and revealing his kingdom to the people. What did Jesus do in the darkness of people's affliction and oppression in Galilee, Decapolis, Judea, Jerusalem, and the other side of the Jordan? He went into their darkness, the thick of it, of the earth, and he revealed who? God, right? And he revealed what? The kingdom. And our purpose is exactly the same. And Jesus is saying, the light is upon you here. And you are the light in the world and in the darkness. And here's the most important word in that phrase. It's the word in. Not just of. You are the light in the darkness. You are, right? This is your identity. You are the light of the world in the world. And so that is this purpose call. This is our, our identity. And then Jesus continues to, to go on. And he explains what this looks like in 14. Yeah, I think it needs explanation too because it's easy for us to lose sight when we hear words like salt and light. And he reads, you read on and it says that you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light uh, or light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they can see your good works and may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And that's what Derek said, that people are giving glory to God because Jesus is bringing the light into their spaces. And um, you get this imagery of uh, the city on a hill, right? And in a traveling nomadic culture, that made a ton of sense because if you put a city on a hill, even at night when it's illuminated, you can see where to go in the midst of the darkness. And that's what we're meant to be. But there's been a common misconception and misinterpretation of that in Scripture where the Christian community for years and years and years, I'm on year 20 of teaching in the church and, and being in the church in various capacities. And I've, I've seen this, that there's this misinterpretation of the text there that the church is meant to be this city on a hill that is far away from everyone else, secluded, yeah. precious, and kept clean and holy and pure from the stain of the world. So those stained, unclean, terrible people called the world can come and find refuge with the rest of us who are hiding from the world in this city we've built on a hill. And we wonder why the That's world good. doesn't want our salt or our light. Right? There's a problem, yeah. and it has to be fixed, and God has to fix it. No, no like agendas of man are going to be able to fix this. God has to, with his kingdom, break us down to fix it. Does that make sense? That's what God's calling us to. For me, you know, I don't want to be someone who puts the light underneath a basket. I want it to shine so the whole house can see. There's various circles that I'm in as a human, and some of those circles, they detest the fact that I'm a pastor. Some of them ridicule me for it, and others of them celebrate it. And some of them even treat me like a pastor, even though they don't love Jesus. Shine your light. Be salt. Be known for who you live for. Hard things to do. You will lose friends over it. Yeah. But man, I don't know if life's about everyone coming to us and finding Jesus by coming into our buildings and up on our hills. I think what Jesus is saying here is something radically different. The days of the world coming to church on the hill need to change, or may I just cross that out and say they've already been gone for a long time. People don't know what to do with the church, but the church should know what to do with people and culture. Because this is what Jesus did everywhere, all the time. He was being light. All, all the places. He had nowhere to put his head. He didn't even have a church building, per se. Nowhere to even sleep at night. 
this is Jesus, the one that we call Savior. And so um, the third point, if you're taking notes, is this, that I'm convinced by Scripture and have had this confirmed over the last 170 days radically for me in my heart that remaining hidden doesn't help. Yeah. Hidden doesn't help. doesn't help the kingdom objective at all. If we're God's chosen instruments to reach the world, then remaining hidden actually hinders what the kingdom could do. Yeah. I don't want to say we have power over the kingdom, but I will say because God chose us, that we can put the kingdom on detour constantly, yeah. not on direct path. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I love that image, man, of, because um, I was, you know, as a kid growing up in the church, that's what it was. Like, hey, we need to be the light on the hill. And I understand that, that metaphor, but the way I always understood it is that, hey, let's build this community of light, and people in the darkness and outside will then come to us when they need hope. They'll come to us when they need a change in their life, when they're oppressed by something or afflicted, they will then come to us. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about the light actually seeping into culture, penetrating the darkness, the light from the city actually going out. So you're not the, you're, you're not the city, you're the, you're the light piece of it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and for the, those of us that grew up in, in church is that, you know, this little light of mine, remember that song? Did you grow up in church? Yeah. I'm going to let it shine. And, and the, the point of that is like, you know, you're not going to, um, those for all of you that grew up in church culture, by the way, um, it's not keeping it up there on the hill. It's bringing it into the darkness. And again, that's what we see Jesus doing. So kind of the, to, to close it out here a little bit, let's just talk about, just for a few moments, Jesus says, you all, right, all of us, one, you are salt, right? Not that you're going to become salt, not that you are like salt. You are actually salt, one, of the land, Right? Not just the earth, but right where your feet are in this moment, in the next, in the next, in Monday, right? And next Sunday, right where your feet are, you are the salt, right? Everywhere. And two, you are the light of the world. You're going into the darkness because the light has come, Jesus. He's given you authority and power as a disciple of Jesus. And now that his light, as Isaiah says, is upon you, you take that into the world, into the darkness, and our goal and our purpose out of our identity is to reveal who God is and to talk about his kingdom, right? By being meek, by, you know, generous love, those types of things, sacrificial service. We need to bring the kingdom into, into the community, into culture. And so here's kind of, I'll share this, probably my, my big question real quick. Jesus speaks about these two identity statements, and he's saying they're here because both of them, salt and light, the purpose of them is to have effect on their surroundings. Are you with me? So they're actually supposed to have effect on, on what they go into the middle of. So you are the salt, you're everywhere, you're the light, you're the, the shine in the darkness. So both affect the surroundings. And so um, when we think about light, of the world and salt of the land. When we hear Jesus teaching that and we actually think about that, here's the question I felt like I had to ask myself, you know, hundred and something days ago. And I want to ask you now, when you hear about light of the world, salt of the earth, how are we doing at that as a church? And are we doing church that way? Just for you to think about that. Like when we actually do church, are we going, we're doing it in a way of salt and light. We're doing it the way of Jesus. Um, or, and here's what I felt. I felt like there are things that we can do in this dual calling of salt and light, being light in the darkness, salt of the land. And I would say this, here's my answer to that. And this is for all of us. Right? This is us together. I would say, and this is like a call, let's do this. Um, I would say, friends, we have a lot of room to grow on this. I have a lot of room to grow on this. I have a lot of room to be challenged on what it means to actually be salt. Not to be like salt, not a future existence of salt, but like right now to be salt and light. 
we have a lot of room to grow, I think a lot of room to be pushed, and a lot of room to change. And so when I read this, and Justin read it, um, and we're looking at the Sermon of the Mount, this like, this like core of Jesus' teachings for his church, of saying live like this, do community like this, be on a mission like this, I would say, are we in sync with the way of Jesus? And I think that's something that we want to continue to look at. And if we're not, right, because we can't get it perfect, if we're not, I'd say, let's go after it. Let's go after it. Not the perfect, polished version of it, but what does it look like to actually live out salt and light, to be salt and light, and to actually live out the way of Jesus through the Sermon on the Mount? So that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah, I think there's a lot there. Yeah. I think it's, it's not to say that everything we have been doing is something no, that's wrong. not at all. I think um, when you look at, at being kingdom people, so often um, we've removed the idea of flexibility and movement from church. We've, we're about these seven things, and we only do these seven things. We set it and we forget it, right? That infomercial thing, set it and forget it. And I think, yeah, our, our theology stays the same. But the Spirit searches the deep things of God and leads us in what the objectives are and, and how we live that out. And I think we, we could learn and grow more as, as a community of what it means to be um, used by God more like the apostles were, where they're flexible to what God's call is almost on a moment-to-moment -moment yeah. basis in regard to what it looks like to be salt or looks like to be light. Um, you, don't, you don't see the apostles building churches in the same way that we build churches. Right? They're raising up a people and equipping a people. But it's definitely not about the things that we've allowed uh, our affections to deeply get attached to in our day. And so for me, um, I'm more curious about where, where we've not been yet than where we've been, quite honestly. Um, I'm a lot more curious about what Jesus can do with us when we don't have the comforts and the familiarity yeah. and the regularity and the predictability that some of it gives us from gathering inside of our building. Yes, I'm 1,000% aware that next week, whether I'm, maybe I'm wrong about this, we're cleared to maybe meet back in our buildings again or whatever it is for various types of businesses in our, in our culture and, and in our current state of co coronavirus. Um, a little of that doesn't sound all that appetizing to me. Because I'm, I'm more curious what God's going to continue to do as we do something that's different. Um, and I'm not afraid of what's different either. And I think that's another area of growth. But I think salt only does the work that salt does when it's touching something. Light only shines when it's not covered and when it's not buried. And some of the greatest change I've ever seen in people's lives have happened outside of the context of a Sunday morning gathering when I'm doing an art show in Laguna Beach, or when I'm, sometimes I'll do some consulting in the public world with organizations that we've label, labeled secular. Man, the light shines far where people need the light, where people need the salt. And that's where I'm curious. What could, what could we do? How could we grow to find ourselves in places where it's really obvious that we're salt and light, like Jesus said? I don't want to be called New Community Church more than I want to be called someone that's in love with Jesus, right? That's right. And right now they could just yeah. call us Newcom. It's easy. Two words, real short. What about like, oh, those, those crazy people that love everybody from that church called Newcom. I mean, that's good. I'll wear that one. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do have a lot of questions about it. So that's, that's in, a, in a lot of ways where I've been sitting. That's good, man. So we hope... Um, we hope this stirs in you, and maybe not even the same way, but we hope it stirs in you. And again, like, what does it look like? Because none of us have achieved, like, I'm salt, I'm light, I know how to do it. Like, how do we go deeper into that? How do you go deeper into that? How does God reveal that to you more? And I hope you hear us. The biggest thing for today is we're not trying to go after some trend or something we read in some other book. We're trying to go after the way of Jesus. I hope you all hear that, right? Like, isn't that what we want to do with our days? And we talk about that all the time. Like, we want to actually be more like Jesus. 
and we're not going to settle all the days of our lives, right? We're not going to settle for anything less than that. We're going to pursue it and actually go after it through an early church New Testament lens of what could God do through us if we actually lived this way. And it's going to challenge us, right? But again, our goal, our motto, be more like Jesus, less like church, right? And so may God reveal something to you here. May God reveal something to you online. May God speak to you when he calls you salt of the land and light of the world. Amen? Amen, Amen, everyone. Hey, good to be with you guys online. Hope to see some of you soon. Bye-bye.